It's really, really great to be here and to hear so many inspiring speakers talk about the future. I am going to do the same thing, but before I bring us into the future, I'm going to take us back, and, and actually way, way back, uh, predating any of us in this room. If you picture 100 years ago, and we've all seen the, the old black and white footage, uh, maybe it's a horse-drawn carriage moving down a bumpy road, uh, or maybe it's an assembly line where they're making Model T cars, any color as long as it's black. Back to the days when the Eiffel Tower was the tallest building in the world, the, the real one, not the Las Vegas version here. The, a loaf of bread costs seven cents. It was the dawn of the era of mass production, of assembly lines that churned out more and more and more products. And businesses built their success around selling more units, driving margins. And consumers were trained in this model as well. It was the era of the term conspicuous consumption. People buying for the sake of buying. Houses started to have bigger closets. People moved to the suburbs. They started to get garages. And they filled those garages with things. But where are we today? How many of you have heard of Marie Kondo? So Marie Kondo, a few of you. Marie Kondo, her entire thing, and by the way, she has a book that sold tens of millions of copies, an incredibly successful Netflix show, all about getting rid of our things. We have entered an era where we have so much stuff that it's having an impact on our psyche. And it's not actually making us happier or more successful. The challenge that we have in the business world is that business schools are still teaching Porter's value chains. We're still learning about a mass production business paradigm. And the world has changed. We all know this, right? We heard already today, we heard things like cloud, mobility, IoT. The world is more connected than ever before, and we have access to information beyond what we've ever seen. Nine out of 10 Fortune 500 companies from 1955, nine out of 10 of those companies are gone. You know, they've either become acquired, they've gone out of business, or they've merged with other companies. The world has changed. Let's look at a few industries as examples. How many of you still get a physical newspaper delivered to their home? So let me guess, you know, born in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I I'm in that boat, by the way. I still get a Wall Street Journal delivered to my home every day. What's incredible is that sales of printed newspapers are down at levels not seen since the 1940s. But I bet all of us in this room are consuming more information than ever. Consuming information and having reliable and, and informative information that helps us make decisions is more important than ever. But the number of pages being printed is declining, even as the amount of information that we're consuming is going up. Take the automotive industry, for example. Sales of cars around the world declined last year, even in areas like China and India where they thought that was never going to happen. But guess what? Miles driven have gone up. We don't need to own a car to be able to experience transportation, which is something that's really exciting to me as a parent of three young boys. My hope is that by the time they get to the age where they're going to want a driver's license, they won't even need one, right? It's probably wishful thinking. But still, we can imagine that. And, and there are changes in our lives that we could not have even imagined before today. How many of you have stayed in an Airbnb before, have used an Airbnb? A lot, a lot of you. I, myself, took a trip with my family uh, last month. And I, if I think back 10 years ago, I never would have imagined that 10 years from today, I'll take my family to a complete stranger's house, they'll move out, I'll move in, I'll read their books, I'll use their linens, and, that's, and, and it's going to be the best experience that my family and I have, have had. We never would have 
imagined that. So the world has changed, and we are all people, you know, in our, in our home lives, and we bring that same sentiment to our lives in business. So let's talk about what it takes to succeed in this new world. Well, first off, businesses need to change the way they think about the value they provide to the world. So if the era of mass production is what you see on the left-hand side of this chart, where everything was built around building an incredible product, shipping that out through the most efficient and optimized channels as possible, and getting that out to the end customer, you can see how that model does not value customer value as much as we need to today. So what we are seeing successful companies doing is making a shift from the era of mass production to the era of the customer. The era of the customer being at the center of everything that we do. And when we start to make that shift, we think about what is it, if it's not simply units and not simply margins, what is it that drives value? Because we are all here in this room because we want to be successful. We want to take that trip. I'm hoping I can figure out a way to get on that trip too. I don't, I don't know how it's possible, but you might, maybe I'll figure out how to show up. We all want to take that trip, so what is it that we need to do? We need to acquire the customers, the subscribers, and we need to provide ongoing value to them in the form of valuable services. The products themselves become the conduit for these valuable services. And what's exciting about that is the products be can become a platform for continuous improvement. They can become a platform for delivering exceptional outcomes. Not simply, we need to own the machine for the sake of owning it. We have a job we need to get done as the customer. And this is going to enable us to get the job done in the most secure and the most optimized and the most managed way possible. So I'll give you a few examples of companies we've seen make this transition from products to subscribers in an effective way. So take NCR. You may or may not know them, but if you've ever bought anything in your life, you've probably come into contact with NCR. They got their start selling cash registers to saloons back in the Wild West, back even before the, the 100 years ago. But if you think about how we transact, how we buy today, many times we're not even using cash that goes in the cash register. And in fact, if you transact in certain regions of the world, it's almost entirely cashless. And so CR was being faced with competition from the likes of Stripe, electronic payment providers. So they recognized they needed to make a transition from simply selling physical cash registers to selling electronic payment systems. Another iconic company we've seen make this transition is one that's near and dear to my heart because I grew up at a time, an era of the guitar hero. And I heard some of the, the songs that I remember uh, from my youth this morning, the guitar jams. So Fender Guitar realized a couple of things. If you listen to pop music today, the music that my sons listen to, there's not a lot of electric guitar riffs anymore. It's a lot of synthesizer, probably a lot of computer-generated uh, music. In fact, Fender was finding that a lot of their customers were going away, and by going away, it's a euphemism for passing away. They were getting older and older. Not only that, but playing the guitar is really hard. I, I haven't tried it myself, but I, I've, I've seen people pick it up and try to, try to play the guitar from scratch. It's really difficult, and in fact, they found that the majority of their customers, if they couldn't be successful with the guitar within six months, they never played. But if they could, they were musicians for life. So if you think about products becoming conduit for services, what Fender Guitars has done is not the guitar as a service model, as you might think, but they've thought about how do we offer services that enhance the value of the guitar, that allow the customer to become successful. So they've offered training and learning services. They have offered community, subscription community for their customers, and it's been very successful. And Rico, right? Rico from moving to providing physical machines that provide copies to providing business process solutions for customers. So when you do this right, you unlock growth. 
So at Zora, we work with the thousands of companies that are leading the subscription economy, and we've tracked their growth against standard indices such as the S&P 500, the FTSE. We found that subscription companies have grown 350% in the last seven and a half years, faster than the S&P by five times. Sustainability is something that's also very important to me. And if you think about this shift from planned obsolescence of machines to machines as a conduit for ongoing services, you can think about how the value of these products and services can sustain out in the future so that customers don't have to co co consistently replace machines. They can use software to, to upgrade these to continue to add value, which is, of course, better for our planet and better for all of us. And again, why we are all here, because subscriptions can provide and help unlock growth with the products becoming a conduit for valuable services. So I'm really excited at, as Zora, as a representative of Zora here, uh, to, uh, to embrace what Rico uh, is, is offering out to you, and that is the opportunity to grow. Thank you very much.